Check, one, two, check. Check, one, two. Check, one, two, check. Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox. Welcome to the channel. In today's video, we are going to be talking about Nirvana's Sliver music video. Did you know there is an entire story behind this music video? It involves Dave Grohl appearing on the scene, Chad Channing leaving the scene, Danny Peters believing he was going to be Nirvana's next drummer, Danny Peters of Mudhoney, and oddly, a can of sausage, specifically this Prairie Belt can of sausage that Kurt is holding in a Sounds Weekly interview. As usual, in order for me to make all this connect the dots and make sense to you, we're gonna start from the beginning and we're gonna tell a story in chronological order. First off, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that Kurt named the song Sliver because he thought that music journalist of the time would call the song Silver. And he was right. It was sort of his little way of trolling people. Even a couple years ago, I came across a YouTube channel that did a Nirvana history video and they called Sliver Silver. So it worked. However, our story begins way back in 1990. <laughs> The summer of 1990, Chad Channing is complaining to his bandmates, Chris Novoselic and Kurt Cobain, he wants to contribute to their music catalog. He has songs that he's written, he wants to write lyrics, he wants to help out on guitar, he wants them to play songs that he has written. Nirvana has achieved some major underground success and they're starting to be noticed and they've got a whole new crop of songs that they've demoed. And you know what I'm talking about, those songs would end up on Nevermind. Kurt and Chris are quite satisfied with the music. Chad is not. Chad feels as though his creativity is being ignored. At the same time, these major record labels are sending A&R representatives to meet Kurt and Chris and Chad and inviting them to fancy dinners in New York and LA. And Kurt and Chris, they're aware that, hey, we're about to break into the big time. It's coming. It might not be this week. It might not be this month. It might not be this year, but it's coming and they start to feel like Chad Channing's drumming is not up to par with a major record label band. They encourage Chad, and this is one little minute point that hardly anyone ever talks about, if ever, Chris and Kurt did not immediately just say, Chad, you're out of the band, we're gonna get a better drummer. Chad did not immediately say, well, you're not gonna let me be creative in this process. We're not gonna use my song, so I quit. It didn't go like that. Kurt and Chris encouraged Chad to take professional drum lessons. They did not want to get rid of Chad. They wanted to give him a chance. They said, dude, get some professional lessons get better at drums, and then you'll be up to par with what we're doing. We won't have to get rid of you. Chad, in his pride, now I'm a drummer. If somebody told me to get professional lessons, I totally get it. When you're a DIY kind of person, you're self-taught, you're very proud of what you've taught yourself. If someone said, dude, you need some lessons, yeah, I get it. Chad's pride was hurt. He refused to get the lessons. This is why they start to look for a new drummer. So at the same time that Chad is upset, his creativity is being ignored, Kurt and Chris believe that his drumming is not up to par. They also ask Chad to rehearse more with the band. Chad lived on Bainbridge Island. Chris is in Tacoma. Kurt's in Olympia at this time. They're all far apart. It takes some time for them to get together. They need someone who's closer, who's willing to rehearse more more often. So when it comes to Chad Channing eventually being booted out of the band, it was really Chad's fault. Had he just done what Kurt and Chris asked him to do, we probably would have never met Dave Grohl. The last straw was Chad refusing to get lessons and refusing to rehearse more often. That's when they said, gotta let you go. College radio stations and the insiders of the music industry who know what they're gonna put out in the future, they all want Nirvana. With A&R representatives from major record labels calling for courtship on Kurt and Chris, they just decided we gotta get a better drummer. If our drummer isn't going to make himself better, then we just need to get a better one. 
Now, whether it was mutual or whether Chad was fired, we'll never know. But from my research, it seems like they let him go. To sort of save face, Chad was like, well, you know what? I was frustrated anyway. Maybe this is for the best. And they go their separate ways. We come to July 11th, 1990. Danny Peters, formerly of Mud Honey and later The Screaming Trees, and then even later back to Mud Honey, would fill in for Chad. On July 11th, 1990, Kurt, Chris, and Danny Peters would go and record the song Sliver, which would later appear on Nirvana's third album, Incesticide. The recording that you hear on the Incesticide album is not Dave Grohl, it is Danny Peters. Oddly, and just to throw this in there, did you know that it's now thought that the guy just crashing the cymbal and the bass for Polly on Nevermind is actually Chad Channing? They got Dave and Chad's recordings mixed up and they don't know which one is on the Nevermind album. One more reason why I believe that Chad should have been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame along with Nirvana, but you know how they are. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame never ceases to make somebody mad. Like and comment if you think Chad Channing should have been in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Dave and Kurt and the rest of them. Anyway, I digress. We're getting off topic. Danny Peters would continue to rehearse with Nirvana all the way up until September of 1990. He's been in the band for three months. He even recorded a song with them, Sliver, and he feels as though I'm next. I'm going to be the next Nirvana drummer. On September 22nd of 1990, Danny Peters would play a live show with Kurt and Christ at the Motorsports Garage. This is now known as a very iconic show. It was sort of one of those shows that just proved to everyone how powerful this music was going to be. People went ape at this show. Very ape. The next day, after the Motorsports Garage show on September 23rd, Danny Peters is featured in an interview with Nirvana as Nirvana's drummer in Sounds Weekly. Sounds Weekly was a UK thing. It was a weekly music publication that talked about the new and upcoming bands, the biggest things going on. Kurt was very proud to make it into Sounds Weekly. He even for quite some time wore a Sounds t-shirt, which you can see and I think he wore it at the Reading Festival and, and various interviews and photo shoots. The Sounds Weekly photo shoot interview happened at Chris and Shelley Novoselic's house during a barbecue on September 23rd, 1990. Now, Chris and Shelley would later become vegetarians, but at this point in time, they're still eating meat. You see Danny here in the photo shoot and, oh, who's this guy in the background? Well, this is weird. This is kind of awkward. That's Dave Grohl. What Danny Peters did not know is Kurt and Chris had flown in another drummer one day before the Motorsports Garage show. On September 21st, Dave Grohl arrived. The very next day, Nirvana has a show with Danny Peters. The very next day after that, they do an interview with Danny Peters as their drummer. And here's Dave in the background, minding his own business, da 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 da. Had to be weird for him, right? At this point on September 23rd, during the Sounds Weekly photo shoot, two days after Dave Grohl's arrival, he's just a guest. He's just hanging out. They're just trying to see if they can get along with this guy and if he's cool enough for them to want to tour with. They have not even auditioned him yet they haven't jammed yet danny's still the guy he's on deck as you'd say in baseball no one knows what he can do yet he's in the batting cage he knows what he can do and it had to have been awkward for him right because he knew like oh my god like this guy's doing a photo shoot i'm literally pictured in the background just hanging out and uh I'm probably going to replace him. That had to be strange, right? They had not had time. They had the show. They had the interview and the barbecue the next day. Danny has no clue that this dude who's hanging out in the background is there to take his place. If they like him. If he fits in. If he's better than Danny. Dave Grohl actually went to the Motorsports Garage show as a guest of Chris and Shelly. When he first arrived, he did not stay with Kurt. He stayed with Chris and Shelly for the first month. And although he was a guest of the band, he chose to hang out in the crowd because his favorite underground band, the Melvins, were playing. So Dave's in the crowd at the Nirvana show watching the Melvins, watching Nirvana as an onlooker, as a spectator, as a fan. 
Now, personally, as a drummer, if I'm Dave Grohl, I've been invited to audition for a band and I have the luck the chance to watch another drummer playing with them, I'm gonna be taking notes. I'm gonna be writing down, what does this drummer do well? What does he not do so well? What can I do to improve their songs? So Dave's in the crowd watching and he's taking notes. And he did have the cassette tape, Bleach. So he knew the songs very well. He had come prepared. He took the Bleach cassette tape, he learned all the songs, he practiced them. So once he comes to Washington, he's ready to go. Then he gets the chance to see the drummer, the other drummer that may be replacing Chad Channing and sort of size him up. By the end of the show, Dave is very confident. I think I can do a better job than that guy. At that time, Dave Grohl says of the cassette tape Bleach, you look at the cover of Bleach and you just think that they're these big burly lager drinking guys. They look kind of nasty on the front, almost like a metal band, but with this retarded weirdness about them. Dave thought that Nirvana's Bleach sounded a bit like the Melvins, and that was okay with him because like I said before, the Melvins was Dave's favorite band at this time. So he was quite okay with Nirvana having that Melvins-esque sound. But boy was he in for a big surprise because Kurt Cobain was about to pull some songs out of his hat that were nothing like Bleach. Later, when Michael Azarad would interview Dave for the Come As You Are book, Dave would say of that show, they didn't completely blow me away or anything. The Melvins played before them, and I was so into the Melvins that I was spent by the time Nirvana came on. Dave would also talk about that motor sports show to Michael Azarad, and he would admit that he was in fact analyzing Danny Peters' drumming, and this is what he had to say about it. He's an incredible drummer, Dave said, but I didn't think Nirvana sounded quite right with Peters. He didn't quite fit. It was like a man wearing a very nice hat that nevertheless didn't go with his suit. Dave, quiet, cool, calculating, confident as ever that he would in fact soon be replacing Peters, closely stood by the next day after the show during a Sounds Weekly interview and photo shoot. Again, Kurt and Chris had not yet had the time to audition Dave, so he's just hanging out and they're all not saying anything to Peters, who believes he's Nirvana's drummer. So Peters would be featured in the article as Nirvana's drummer. We see Dave hanging out in the background. He's not even bothering to look at the camera because he's probably feeling kind of awkward. He may have even been feeling a little bad. Like, man, I'm just gonna let this guy have the time of his life as Nirvana's drummer right now because I know I'm gonna be taking it real soon. Keep in mind, he doesn't know Kurt and Chris. He doesn't know how they feel about him. He's a guest at this point. He's not a friend. Peters is a well-known confidant. Dave's just a guest, so he's being humble. He's staying in the background. When do you think they're gonna audition Dave? That would come afterward, a couple days afterward. I would bet my bottom dollar that as this photo was being taken, Dave Grohl was thinking, you will all know who I am very, very soon. Keep in mind, Dave even said the Melvins went before Nirvana. That means the Melvins opened up for Nirvana. That's how big Nirvana was getting even that early on. This transition of popularity must have happened very quickly because you see the Melvins is at the top of the flyer. The flyer was made with the Melvins being the closing act, Nirvana, the Dwarves, the Derelicts being the opening acts. Typically, your closing act is going to be at the very top. Somewhere in between this flyer being made and the actual show, Nirvana gained more popularity than the Melvins because they flip-flopped and the Melvins opened for Nirvana. I know that had to be a bit, and I'm not talking crap or nothing like that, but I know that Dale Crover and Buzz Osborne had to be at least a little upset that Kurt Cobain the student had become Kurt Cobain the master. And reading about this sounds photo shoot interview is when I seen this damned can of sausage. I've seen this picture a hundred times. Why is Kurt Cobain holding this? It's so weird, like who just holds a can of sausage, right? What is it about this imagery that Kurt liked it so much that this can of sausage would pop up again 
two years later in the Sliver music video. Keep in mind, Danny Peters recorded the Sliver song July 11th, 1990 with Kurt and Chris. The music video was not made until two years later, March of 1992. Why did Kurt Cobain hang on to this can of sausage? Kurt Cobain was a very creative, artsy guy. If you're a hardcore fan, you know that he liked to write nonfiction stories and narrate them. You know that he liked to paint and draw. He was a sculptor. He did all kinds of things with imagery. And sometimes he would just really like objects. It was quirky. It was odd. But sometimes he would sort of fall in love with objects. Dolls and collages and just all kinds of weird objects that he would keep around him. And this can of sausage is going to pop up again later in the story. So let us continue. A few days after the photo shoot, Kurt and Chris finally have the time to audition Dave, and they do this at a place called the Dutchman. Chris Novoselic would say this about Dave's audition at the Dutchman. We knew within two minutes that he was the right drummer, says Chris. He was a hard hitter. He was really dynamic. He was so bright, so hot, so vital, he rocked. So immediately, they knew that Dave was the right guy. And now comes something that Kurt and Chris loathed. They hated this. They disdained it. Someone had to tell Danny Peters, oh, and by the way, he was booked for a European tour coming up with Nirvana. Someone had to tell Danny Peters he's out of the band. Kurt and Chris were not good at giving someone bad news. They knew it would hurt their feelings. Keeping in mind that Danny Peters is their friend and drummed for a band they admired, Mudhoney. They really didn't want to tell this guy that he actually, you're not Nirvana's drummer and uh, we got to let you go. Remember that guy that was hanging out with us at the barbecue and then Sounds Weekly came and interviewed us and we introduced you as Nirvana's drummer? Well, actually, that guy in the background, we auditioned him and uh, he's better than you. So, sorry. Yeah, they weren't going to do that. So, this is what happened. Hey, kids. Got a special treat for you today. Cobain's here. You know, Kurt Cobain from Aberdeen. What's going on, baby? Not a damn thing. I see. How are you? I'm Did pretty good. Did you that? Um, not really. No. Well, I was, uh, I was fine. I was just hanging out here on the Boy Meets Girl show, and, um, you called up and said, I want to play some songs. So I said, Rockin' good news. <laughs> Bloody brilliant. Kurt, who hated any confrontation that would result in a friend's feelings being hurt, tried to avoid the conversation by announcing on Calvin Johnson's Chaos Radio in Olympia that they had a new drummer, and that new drummer's name was not Danny Peters. It was David Grohl. Calvin Johnson, owner of K Records. A lot of people listen to Johnson's radio station. Unfortunately, I could not find the entire interview, but part of the interview is on YouTube. If you'd like to listen, Kurt plays Opinion, Lithium, I believe Dumb, and maybe one other song, that September 25th, 1990 Calvin Johnson interview. So Kurt was hoping someone would hear this and tell Danny, or maybe Danny would listen to it, and then they wouldn't have to have that odd face-to-face -face conversation. Interestingly, Kurt thought so highly of Dave's drumming that he compared him to Dale Crover during that September 1990 interview. He said, he's a baby Dale Crover. He plays almost as good as Dale. And within a few years practice, he may even give Dale a run for his money. Later in another interview, Kurt would say this about Dave Grohl. He's the most well-adjusted boy I've ever met. He's totally easy to get along with. Everyone loves him. He plays drums better than anyone I've ever heard. I mean, he blows away John Bonham. Kurt even acknowledged the awkward situation with Peters. Of Peters, Kurt would say, he's such a beautiful drummer, but we can't pass up the opportunity to play with the drummer of our dreams. He's been the drummer of our dreams for like two years, said Kurt. 
Kurt and Chris had watched Dave play with his former band Scream, who'd been on the same bill as Buzz and Dale's Melvins. They'd mentioned to Buzz how impressed they were with Dave's drumming. They even stated to Buzz, quote, if we only had a drummer like that. So it wasn't necessarily that they were saying Dave Grohl was the drummer of their dreams. They were saying a drummer like that. Little did they know they would end up with that exact drummer. Buzz, who was always networking with other musicians, took mental note of this. And you all know the story. When Scream ended up falling apart, Buzz would call Curtin and Chris and say, I can, get, I can contact Dave, I can get him up here. You guys said you were impressed with him. You told me once that if you only had a drummer like that, well, here's your opportunity. And that brings Dave right up to this situation with Danny Peters. Dave was stranded without money, without a band. Although if you watch this video about that time period, you'll find out that it wasn't that bad for Dave. Sure, he wasn't doing what he would love, but he wasn't exactly in a bad situation either. However, I digress back to the story. Kurt had hoped to avoid this disappointing conversation with Danny Peters. He just wasn't that good at telling people, you know, just being assertive. He just wasn't that good at it. Even in an MTB interview after In Utero dropped and in Michael Azared's book, The Story of Nirvana, Dave and Kurt and Chris talk about how passive aggressive they are. And they say, we just bitch about each other behind each other's backs. They're not good at just being assertive and saying what they mean, mean what you say and say what you mean, right? So Kurt is hoping that Danny will just hear the radio broadcast or someone who knows Danny will hear the radio broadcast wh where they announce Dave, and then he won't have to tell Danny, you know, you're, you're done, right? The only problem was, this is pre-internet. If you don't catch a live broadcast, you don't get to hear it. There is no going back and replaying it, right? Danny doesn't hear the broadcast. Certain people around them hear the broadcast, but they don't want to be the one to tell Danny. They know that he's psyched about the European tour he's supposed to be going on with Nirvana. So, uh, no one tells Danny. In the end, Kurt would have to call Danny and tell him directly. Kurt called me up, says Peters. He said, Nirvana's going to go with Geffen. And I'm like, cool. So I say, what about this tour? But then Kurt gets a little quiet and he starts to mumble, uh, um, well, uh, well, we got another drummer. Now, Peters claims, and I quote, I wasn't bummed at all. I kind of half-ass expected it. I'm still not bummed. Now, much later, Danny Peters would admit, yes, I was very bummed. He was mainly bummed that he never got the drum on Nevermind. He said it was such a powerful album, obviously an album that will go down in history as one of the best. And he actually was bummed that he didn't get the drum to all these new songs that Kurt was pulling out of his hat. Anyone would have been bummed. It would have been terrible news. Now, as fate would have it, Mud Honey would get back together. Danny Peters would drum for the Screaming Trees for a period of time. This guy had a career all his own in his own right, one that people could be jealous of. It's not as if Danny just disappeared from rock and roll. He ended up having a great career himself. And it's worth noting that the group remained friends to this day. Aside from an illustrious drumming career, little known fact about Danny Peters, he had a small role in a Chris Farley film called Black Sheep. Do you guys remember Chris Farley, David Spade, Tommy Boy, Black Sheep, those, those 90s movies? Go back, watch it again, and see if you can spot Danny Peters alongside David Spade and Chris Farley. Back to the can of sausage. What's this all about? How does it tie into our story? To answer that question, we need to fast forward two years. <laughs> Nirvana had released their third album, Incesticide, only three months earlier in December of 1992. Come March of 1993, two years after that Sounds Weekly photo shoot with the can of sausage and Danny Peters as the drummer, they decide to make a music video for the song Sliver. Very little to no marketing was ever done for Incesticide. Matter of fact, I can only find one interview where Kurt is even asked about the album. Now in Michael Azarad's book, they basically say, you know what, we were so hot at the time, we just decided to take the B-sides, put them on the shelves, let the fans find it themselves. Boy, did fans find it themselves. 
Despite a lack of any promotion, Incesticide would reach number 51 on the Billboard 200 and sold 500,000 copies within the first two weeks. That's a gold record right there without even promoting it, without even mentioning that it exists. This is how hardcore Nirvana fans were after the release of Nevermind. It was a very Merry Nirvana Christmas that year of 1992 for my stepbrother and I. I remember it vividly because it's the only Christmas in my childhood where I actually got something I wanted. And what I received was a Nintendo Entertainment System with Mario 1 and Duck Hunt. And I even got the light laser gun to shoot the ducks with. However, my much older stepbrother, who is a angsty teenager at the time, he received a Sony Walkman along with two cassette tapes. Now, my parents knew nothing about 90s rock music. They went and purchased these cassette tapes randomly. One was a Grateful Dead tape, which my stepbrother threw away as soon as my parents had forgotten about it as to not hurt their feelings. The other tape that they randomly chose from a Kmart store was Nirvana Incesticide. They'd heard that Nirvana was a hot band, and it was basically the cheapest cassette tape they could find of Nirvana's, so they grabbed it. Again, my parents knew nothing about music. They just randomly chose two cheap cassette tapes, and one of them happened to be a winner. My stepbrother would allow me to use his Sony Walkman and listen to this cassette tape, which I found kind of poppy at the time. If you listen to the first few songs on Incesticide, it's kind of upbeat, poppy sort of music. I really enjoyed it as a kid. And I, in turn, would let him play my Nintendo. And I believe it brought us closer together as step siblings. We had these mutual things to share and these mutual interests in common. We liked the same music. We liked the same video games. It was really good time in my life. Anyway, the one song that seemed to stand out from all other songs on the third album, one that was poppy enough for MTV to play a music video, was Sliver. So it's decided we're going to make a music video. I think Aneurysm is probably the most popular and probably the best song on that album, just my opinion. However, it's much too hardcore, much too raunchy for someone like MTV to play. That's why they chose Sliver. Kurt Cobain was feeling nostalgic, reminiscing about how far he'd come in only two years. And he'd always felt guilty about relieving Danny Peters of his drumming duties. He'd always felt very grateful to Danny for how well he took it. He didn't give Kurt a hard time. He didn't argue with him. He just said, hey, man, I'm happy for you. If that drummer's going to do better justice for Nirvana, I wish you the best. Kurt was remembering who actually recorded Sliver, Danny Peters. So you see, that's why Dave Grohl is in the music video, but Danny Peters is the one who actually recorded it. These things happened two years apart. Danny had remained such a positive figure in Kurt's life that Kurt got an idea. He wanted to set up his garage in Seattle the same way his apartment looked in Olympia. With his new money and his new fame and everything, he wanted to nostalgically recreate what it was like to live in that apartment when he had nothing when Dave Grohl first arrived. When you watch the Sliver music video, it gives you an idea of what it would have been like to be in Kurt Cobain's Olympia apartment. He set up his garage the same way he remembered his apartment. All of his belongings had been in a storage unit. Everything from his Olympia apartment had been in storage for two years. He took it all and he set it up in his Seattle garage. Now there's a lot of talk about Kurt Cobain being homeless, not having money when, you know, true and false at the same time. Geffen gave them a $250,000 advance. Dave and Kurt were behind on their rent several months. I believe it was about five months. They were going to be evicted. But at the same time, they knew that they were moving on to bigger and better things. So it was like, oh, who cares if we get kicked out? When Kurt comes back, Yes, it's true, his stuff's out on the sidewalk. And then he takes all of his stuff, he puts it in a storage unit. Two years later, when he's rich and famous, he gets it out of the storage unit to recreate that moment in time in a music video. 
He took all of his belongings that had been in storage and set everything up the way he remembered it in his Olympia apartment, only in his Seattle garage. To pay homage to his good friend Danny Peters, he placed the Mud Honey poster directly behind Dave Grohl so it could clearly be seen in the video. After all, Danny is the drummer on the recording, and this was Kurt's way of saying thank you, Danny, and paying him respect for helping Nirvana through that transition and being such a good sport about being let go. Kurt also remembered this can of sausage that he was holding and they were laughing about in the only interview that ever featured Danny Peters, in the only interview that ever said Danny Peters was Nirvana's drummer, they were screwing around with that can of sausage and Kurt remembered this. And this is why Kurt stuck it in the Sliver music video. It was an Easter egg for Danny Peters to see. It only shows up for a couple short frames. You really have to be watching for it. For whatever reason, unknown to anyone but the band, Kurt kept that same can of sausage, included it in a video, and it was all one big thank you to Danny Peters. It was saying, I remember that day. I remember what we were talking about. We were making fun of this stupid can of sausage. I remember that, and I remember what you did for me, and I thank you for it. The Sliver music video was Kurt Cobain paying respect to Danny Peters. Danny helped him through the last transition before fame and money, and his dreams came true of being the biggest rock band in the world. So it gives us an idea of how Cobain felt about his friends who were good to him. There are many bands that we would never have even heard of if it was not for Kurt Cobain. He would go out of his way to promote them. He would promote all female bands. Can any of us honestly say that we would ever have heard of Shonen Knife if not for Kurt Cobain? I'm not even sure I would have ever heard of Bikini Kill if it were not for Kurt Cobain or Jawbreaker, or Blood Circus, or Mud Honey, as a matter of fact. So it comes as no surprise to me that Kurt would use his newfound celebrity to promote another band and a friend, because that's the kind of friend he was. Kurt Cobain went out of his way to help people and to thank them when he could. This music video shows you how much Kurt respected and how highly he thought of Danny Peters. That first Sounds Weekly, to get your first Sounds Weekly interview was a huge deal to Kurt Cobain. This was like the, it, it was like his Rolling Stone and he recalled Danny being there. It's like, it's so nostalgic and it's so thoughtful. And that's just the way Kurt was. He would promote the underdog. He would promote anyone that he liked, that he thought, hey, these people aren't getting enough attention. He would insist they're going to open for Nirvana or Nirvana's not playing. The Sliver music video may be a very subtle, enigmatic way of showing appreciation to a friend, but that should tell us that he didn't always make it obvious what he was doing. He wasn't the kind of celebrity who wanted people to know, that's what I'm doing. Look at me. I'm such a great person. I'm thanking a friend. He would do things like that subtly, enigmatically. So the people who knew, knew, and the people who didn't, didn't. I guarantee you, if any YouTuber out there has a big enough audience to get an interview with Danny Peters, I know I don't, or I would try, if you can get Danny Peters to talk to you, ask him what he thinks of the Sliver music video, and I bet he talks about that Sounds Weekly interview and how Kurt was saying thank you to him. I bet he even mentions the can of sausage. Just like Danny was there when they transitioned to Dave and, and into Nevermind, they also include Francis Bean in the music video. So it's also like another transition, right? Like transition from not being a dad to being a husband and father with past and present. It's like this theme of past, present, future. It's very cool. If you've never seen the Sliver music video, go check it out. And I encourage you, if you have time, if you're really interested, Stop it now and then so you can catch frames. There are certain symbols and pictures and posters and just different 
pictures that you will only see for one frame, two or three frames. So you have to be quick with it. Now that you know that the Sliver music video is a peek into the apartment of Kurt Cobain, see what you can catch and read. See what kind of things that you can catch in these short screenshots, these short frames, and it'll give you a little more insight into what kind of person Kurt Cobain was and what he was into. Until next time, bye bye